Grace will talk about the Pelosiism of the uh, Republican Party. All that and nothing more today on the Bill Whittle Live Show. And let's push the button, Neil. There's swinging cats uh, and swinging chicks. Uh, how's it going? Uh, we've got um, something that just seems to me to be almost uh, self-explanatory here, but apparently it's not. Life is not as easy as it appears to be sometimes, and some of the stuff that makes so much sense doesn't make any sense at all. So let's start off with our good friend Harry Reid. I know we have a picture of him here somewhere. Uh, there he is, using um, his typical uh, charming face. Uh, so here's the thing about uh, about Mr. Reed. Um, he basically decided uh, when he was the um, Senate Majority Leader, he decided to do something called the nuclear option. It's called the nuclear option because it's considered to be such a breach of decorum, such a breach of history, such a breach of American traditions and values that you would only resort to it in the most extreme measures. That's why it's called the nuclear options, like using nuclear weapons. And even then you weren't supposed to use it. I don't know how long it has been in place, but the filibuster is essentially a non-constitutional idea that allows an opposition party to draw things out. And the, the short form is, and to be perfectly honest with you, I need to read up on my filibusters just a little bit because it's a little arcane. But the short form is this. With the filibuster in place, in order to confirm somebody like a Supreme Court judge, you need uh, 60 votes in the Senate. That means you need... Uh, all of your Republicans plus a couple of Democrats. However, if you uh, decide to push the nuclear button, you can then um, get a confirmation done without the filibuster, which only requires 52 votes, and we've got 52 votes. So Neil Gorsuch sits there uh, a month after month, apparently, going to be year after year, while the Democrats filibuster run out the clock and basically delay um, the, uh, the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch. Now, I'm all about American tradition. You can tell that because I've got a flag on my shirt. And on my flag, I've got a snake. See it? There we go. Somewhere in there, there's a snake on that flag. Right. Okay, so I get it about tradition. I understand it. But, but, Harry Reid, for, I, I can't even remember what the vote was about. It was so minor. Harry Reid decided to break something like almost 200 years of, of Senate tradition and simply invoke the nuclear option. He simply said, nope, uh, we're just, as Senate Majority Leader, I'm just going to, uh, we're going to eliminate filibusters uh, right now. And then, um, and we'll just get this law passed because we don't have the 60 votes we need. So we'll pass it with, with 52. And that was a breach of decorum almost unequaled in the history of the uh, United States Congress. It's it's way up there. It's way up there. It's up there with the caning of, um, oh my gosh, what was the name? Massachusetts senator was an abolitionist, got caned by a guy, I want to say Rhett from, um, from South Carolina, caned him, almost killed him on the floor of the, of the Congress. Um, the, the Yankee abolitionist who was caned in the head nearly killed with a fractured skull um, his seat sat empty for two years. They wouldn't replace it because they felt so strongly about him being there. And the guy who did the caning was given, I don't know, scores of new canes from people throughout the South who really didn't dig this whole abolition thing. But anyway, that kind of thing happens very frequent, infrequently in this country, unlike other countries where brawls break out and murders and stabbings. And so decorum is decorum. And there's a reason that we have these policies in place. It's designed to be able to allow the majority, I'm sorry, the minority party to have some kind of say and not just be run over hither and yon. So the big question is, why are we waiting for Neil Gorsuch? Because uh, Harry Reid has already used the nuclear option. Why, why are we waiting for Neil Gorsuch? I don't know. I don't know. It's possible, I suppose, that some people are saying, well, we shouldn't lower ourselves to our level and to their level. And uh, hey, let's talk about um, lowering ourselves to that level. Uh, so. Here's the story that I always go to because to me it is an example of exactly the kind of moral clarity that we need to have when we deal with people of the quality and caliber of Harry Reid. Now, this is a civilized country and it's a civilized society. It's a decent, honorable, 
fundamentally good society, and America has achieved what it's achieved by playing by the rules. Playing by the rules is not something that's arbitrary. I know this is coming as a big shock to uh, Democrats and progressives, but playing by the rules means that you play by the rules even if the rules are against what you want to do. You see, even if the rules mean that you're not going to get what you want, you play by the rules because playing without the rules leads to chaos and, and anarchy, and, and you can go much further by making short-term sacrifices by losing by the rules than you would by playing without any rules at all. So, oh, somebody just said, where can I get that shirt? Um, Matthias Grubasic, sorry, my vision's not very good. Ranger Up, by the way, rangerup.com. I get a lot of really great stuff. They've got some terrific graphic design there. Um, okay, so, so we like to play by the rules, and it's important to play by the rules, and it's important to start off by being honest and decent and fair because that's what we are now here's the story this is i heard the story once and i realized this is the only story i need i'm sure i could find many more but it's the only one i need to make the point and i've been making the point with this story for eight years now and this story goes back to uh the battle of guadalcanal in uh in i want to say 1942 in the uh pacific first real battle of the um of the marine corps against the japanese uh, Japanese were building an airfield on Guadalcanal. They didn't leave it very well defended. We landed all these Americans. We took over Guadalcanal, took over the airfield, and then the Japanese Navy, some say that the uh, U.S. Naval Admiral just basically cut and run, but the U.S. Navy abandons the Marines on Guadalcanal, and they go through a period of several months of, of starvation, privation, uh, uh, just living hell. And while they're sitting there without support of the Navy, uh, the Japanese, with their very powerful fleet, have come into this area, down, uh, down through what they call the slot between these two groups of islands, and into this area just off side of uh, Guadalcanal, which I think used to be called Sea Lark Sound or something like that, but it's now called Iron Bottom Sound because of all of the uh, warships that are sitting there on the bottom of the ocean. So the Japanese are being... Um, uh, they're being reinforced and supplied and so on. Now, the Americans have fought really well, and in the very early days of this, when the Japanese looked like they'd been outnumbered and, and abandoned, after brutal fighting of the worst possible kind, people sneaking in at nighttime to cut your throats, no battle lines, no safe areas, nothing, just jungle and infiltration and murder, hand-to-hand -hand fighting in many cases, this brutal introduction to war for these basically decent American farm kids who'd never seen anything like this before, running into these fanatical Japanese uh, defenders. And they had already seen a couple of examples of things where a Japanese soldier would, would appear to surrender or he'd call for a medic and we'd send a medic over to treat this enemy soldier and then the enemy soldier would pull the pin on a grenade and kill the medic and as many other Americans as he could. And this kind of thing was starting to get to be known by the American Marines. However, somewhere in the beginning of the Guadalcanal campaign, um, there was a report that a, a group of Japanese, I believe they've been stranded on one of the very, very tiny little speck islands just around the area in Guadalcanal, had raised a white flag. And, and wanted to surrender. And the Marines figured that there might be 70 people over there, something like that. So um, one uh, decent American, um, I don't know if he was a lieutenant, and I used to have his name for the first time I read it just a couple days ago, and I'm going to tattoo this on my arm because it's such an important name. If somebody can remember it and want to give it to me in the, um, in the comments here on Facebook, that would be great. But in any event, a, a, a young Marine basically said, sir, they're, they're trying to surrender over there. They haven't been fed for three or four weeks. They haven't had any... Uh, any kind of um, resupply. Let's you know, th you know, they're they're surrendering. Let's let's accept their surrender and, and 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 stop those poor guys from starving to death. So they said okay. So they took a Higgins boat or something over to um, the island, and they took a small squad of Marines. I don't know how many, fifteen something in that general area, and they basically went up to where the Marines got off of the boat and went up to where the Japanese were standing there with their white flag. And when all of them had gotten off the boat and were walking towards the Japanese under the white flag, in addition, uh, preparing to take their surrender, the Japanese dropped the white flag, uncovered machine guns, and, and, and shot up that entire patrol. I think three Marines survived by crawling away into the bush. And when they were uh, running away, the three that managed to escape this massacre under a flag of truce, they look back and they could see, I think they said in, in the, at nighttime, they could see the flashing of samurai swords. I forgot to turn this darn phone off. The flashing of samurai swords in the background as these Japanese savages 
executed each one of these Marines that went to rescue them and to provide them aid when they'd run up the white flag. So what does this have to do with the nuclear option? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with the nuclear option. In Guadalcanal, the Marines were, were, had not dealt with the Japanese at a great deal of uh, experience with them yet. And so like decent people, like honorable people, like we are here on, on the conservative side of the spectrum, those decent honorable people went out there to play by the rules of war. The enemy in uniform has surrendered. Is it down again? Oh my God, sorry. This is just driving me nuts. Um, we'll get all this fixed. We got some stories about that coming up too. Sorry about this. I know it's very, very distracting. It's distracting to me too. Go. Hooray. Okay, so, um, so basically, here's what happens. The Marines do the right thing. They do the decent thing. They do the honorable thing. They do the things that Republicans have been doing. They honor the rules. They honor the rules of warfare. The Japanese surrender. They use the rules of warfare to gain an advantage. And since we followed the rules of civilized warfare, we allowed them the opportunity to surrender. We send a team of guys over in good faith out of mercy, out of mercy and decency, goadage. Uh, Lieutenant Frank Gotage, something like that. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you very much, Kirk Server. First Lieutenant Frank Gotage, he takes this patrol over there out of mercy and decency and kindness and abeyance aban of the rules of, of law. And the Japanese use that as a sign of weakness and they take advantage in a very short period of time. They take advantage to kill 25, 30, 40 Marines or however many it was. And that was what they wanted to achieve by breaking all of the rules. They wanted to kill those sm as many Marines as they could, and they killed, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen of them. Now, after that happened, after that happened, after um, uh, Lieutenant Guttage's uh, patrol was ambushed and wiped out under a flag of truce, that word got around. And it got around to the, to the rest of the Marines, and it was so disgusting to our sense of honor and so disgusting to our sense of decency that somebody would use the rules of compassion in order to kill people. And so from that point forward, in Guadalcanal and pretty much everywhere else, we basically said, okay, that's how you want it, that's how you're going to get it. No mercy. We're not going to ask for mercy, and we're not going to give any. If you want to surrender, and by surrendering, you, you basically are, are determined to kill as many people as you can, based taking advantage of our decency, fine. That's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be. Now, we did take many Japanese prisoners during the rest of the war, and in virtually all the rest of the cases, we treated them well and honorably. However, when dealing with the Japanese as a, as a people, when dealing with the Japanese soldiers as an, as an enemy, we stopped playing by the Geneva Convention because they were not playing by the Geneva Convention. And this is entirely the point. You can be an honorable and decent person and play by the rules, but if somebody takes advantage of you playing by the rules in a way to sneak attack you, to punch you in the nose, to knock you out of the game, to kick you in the groin, basically is what it is. Take a low blow cheap shot on you because your defenses are down because you're being an honorable person. It's kind of like a boxer who gets sent to his corner. And as he's being walking to his corner because he just knocked the guy down and he's dizzy. And as he's walking to his corner, the, the boxer on the ground gets up and starts pounding, pounding, pounding on him and knocks him out. Now, if that's going to be the way you want to fight, then we'll fight that way. That's fine with me. We'll fight that way. I would rather not, but that's not my decision. It's your decision, Harry Reid. It's your decision. So when Harry Reid has invoked the nuclear option because he wanted to vote on some trivial thing, and if he wants to destroy hundreds of years of American uh, decency and American um, compromise and and civility, and the word you don't ever hear anymore is comedy, not comedy because it's looking like comedy, comedy, decency, respect, you know, the, the, the appearance of doing the right thing. Now, if you want to destroy that, Harry, and you do, and you did, then you and the Democrats are going to have to pay by the consequences of what you've done. And just like the way the other Japanese in the Pacific had to deal with the consequences of what those men did to that patrol, you and the rest of your Democrats are going to have to live with the fact that you destroyed the filibuster rule, not us. You did. And if you think, and apparently a lot of GOP people think, that we should basically go back to honoring this deal, you're out of your mind. 
You're out of your mind. We should have invoked the... By the way, it shouldn't be called the nuclear option anymore because we're going to use it all the time. If it were me running the Republican Party, we would just do it all the time. We need 52 votes. That's it. All the time. What, what happened to the filibuster rule? Well, it was destroyed. What, what, what was it destroyed by? It was destroyed by the Reed option. It's not the nuclear option because it, it, it shouldn't, it's not a deterrent anymore. Once you break something, you can't unbreak it. You can try to repair it, but you can't unbreak it. And I don't see any reason whatsoever why the Republicans should be playing by the filibuster rules with these people who, destru- who decided to basically destroy this tradition when they had the power for some minor uh, vote that Harry Reid, who's the most corrupt man in the entire history of the United States, with the possible exception of Hillary Clinton, he destroyed it, so he used the read option. Now we should use the read option to confirm Neil Gorsuch tomorrow or today, maybe later this afternoon. And we should use the read option to confirm uh, somebody like Ted Cruz to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we should use the read option to get anything that we want. We should use the read option to understand that we own the House and the Senate for two years, less than that now. And we should use the read option on every single opportunity to get every single thing we want because. Harry Reid is the one that waved the, red, the white flag of truce and then murdered people under, uh, under flag of truce. He's the one that broke the rules. He's the one that used this underhanded method that has always been there but was never used because of decorum. And now that it has been used, we're going to use it. And if, you Republican in, if you're a Republican in the, in the Senate and you are in favor of returning to the filibuster rules that preceded Harry Reid's decision, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. What do you think? What do you think? So, somebody just said, so, so you're saying, screw you, we'll do what we want? That's exactly what I'm saying, Cheryl. Cheryl Toomey, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Screw you, we're going to do what we want. You did it. We were playing fair. We respected the rules. You destroyed them. Therefore, screw you, we're going to do what we want. That's what you do. And if you think that being nice to these people means... And, and, and respecting the, the, the filibuster rule again for the next two years or four or eight or whatever, if you think that that means that when, when they get back into power, they're going to respect it too, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. We're not playing with people who play fair. This is a much bigger issue. I'm going to touch on it briefly because I think it's really kind of the point of things. We don't understand the difference between conservatives and progressives in terms of character. We have entirely different um, ethics, and the ethics are based, as always, on the motivation. I'm generalizing because there are obviously people on both parties who don't fit this pattern, but with that said, conservatives want the government to get smaller. Conservatives believe in the rule of law. Conservatives believe in fair play. Conservatives believe, and you and I believe, because we're competitors. We're competitors. We're we're here for the for those who are big stratosphere lounge uh, watchers. We're a K-type species. Our species pattern survival, our mental survival pattern as Republicans, is to make the best people we can who can compete. And when you can compete, if you're a competitor, if you're the kind of person that that feels like, even if you're not the best player on the team, even if you feel like playing by the rules is to your advantage, then you're going to have a set of of values. I know what I'm speaking to every single conservative and Republican out there, every one of you, every one of you, when I say that we would rather lose fairly than cheat to win. If you don't believe that, I don't know how you can call yourself a conservative, honestly. We'd rather lose fairly than cheat to win because we can compete, because we're capitalists, because we're competitors, because we're individualists. We understand that competition is good for everybody. And when I lose to somebody who's better than me, not different than me, not differently able than me, somebody in whatever endeavor I'm in is better than me, better than me, some people go into a closet and cry. We call these people Democrats. Some people look at what this person did in order to defeat you, and they're not determined to come in second the next time. And so they learn things. They are humble enough to understand that you're not always the best at things. There's always somebody better than you, and there's always something that you can learn from somebody. We're humble enough to accept the lessons of failure to increase our chances of success in the future. That's why we revere the rules. That's why we put up with eight years of Barack Obama, because he was elected. 
He was elected. He did so much destruction to this country, but we look at it and we say, well, okay, but, but he was elected twice. It's our fault that we let that happen. It's our fault. Our messaging and our candidates are so bad that we let that lunatic twice win the elections. Yes, that's exactly right. So what are we going to learn from this? Well, we learned a few things from this. So we like to compete and we play by the rules because the rules are the best outcome long term. Now, the progressives, on the other hand, are not about making government and politics smaller. They're about making it bigger. That's their entire lives. That's their family. Their family is, is politics. And if you're not a member of the liberal family, they disown you out of the family. If you don't agree on abortion and Obamacare and all the rest, you're not invited to Thanksgiving anymore. So they uh, are all about power. And they look at us and they think that we're chumps. We think they're dishonorable cowards. They think we're, that we're just chumps. Because what they do is they think that uh, they think that political power, absolute political power, is necessary to bring heaven on earth here. They don't believe in a heaven in, in heaven. They believe that if they had all of the political power, they could change people, and so they would live in this perfect society on earth. And these people have been trying to go and bring heaven on earth for 120 years now, and in the process of trying to bring about this paradise on earth, they've murdered no less, no less than 100 million people, no less than that. So we're dealing with people whose entire morality, forget philosophy or politics, their morality is based on the higher good. Their morality is based on what they perceive to be the higher good, which when you strip away all of the, all of the fig leaves of helping the poor and all the rest of it, you find out that their politics are based on them having power over you. They have to tell you what to do. And since that higher good is more important to them than any of the rules, they will obey the rules when the rules are in their favor, and they will tell us, chumps, that, look, these are the rules. We, we, we don't want to live without rules, do you? This is what America is. Uh, and Barack Obama has the audacity to get up there and say, that's, that's not who we are. What the hell do you know about who we are, Barack Obama? You grew up overseas, you know, you were, you were raised in a foreign culture, you, your entire childhood and youth was spent smoking dope on the beach in Hawaii. I don't think you really got a clear idea of what America is, but I digress. So, we play by the rules, and they don't. And they're not ashamed of it. They're proud of it. If they say, look, these conservative idiots, these Republican fools, we basically knife them in the back, and now they're coming at us again, and we're waving the flag again, and, and they're coming out, and we're gunning down more of them, how many of these idiots are we going to have to kill? Well, apparently, we're going to have to kill quite a lot of them because people cannot learn the lesson. You fight clean unless your opponent fights dirty, and when, you, when your opponent fights dirty, you fight dirty too or dirtier because if you don't, you're going to lose. And if you lose, then the dirty fighters, the evil people, are going to win. It's not up for discussion. The Marines were crystal clear on this. I read that story, and I was so enraged 50, 60, 70 years later I thought, okay, I get it now. I understand. I really do. I understand the whole flamethrower thing. I get it all. Um, if that's how you want to play, then that's how we'll play. Now, as it turns out, just very briefly, there is, in fact, a mathematical proof of, of my advice here to the Republican Party. And because there's a mathematical proof, that's why I believe it. I don't believe it because I believe it, and then I look for evidence. The evidence tells me this is what I should believe. So here's how I can tell you that there's a mathematical reason why we should invoke the read option and get Gorsuch confirmed immediately and get a conservative concerned ev confirmed every single time. The mathematical explanation is, is, by, um, is by a set of... Uh, of game theory. Game theory is basically an idea that's kind of a mix of philosophy, uh, uh, biology, but mostly mathematics. And what game theory does is it reduces complex interactions to very simple ones, but it maintains the motivation. Okay? It maintains the motivation. So, in game theory, there are a number of different thought experiments, because that's what they are. And one of them is the tragedy of the commons, and that's basically saying everybody's going to take advantage of public resources for themselves, and the public resources basically fall apart. But the one I'm interested here in is, um, is uh, the prisoner's dilemma. Now, I won't set out all of this for you, but it's important you understand the basics. You've got two uh, people who have been arrested for a crime, and they're both being interrogated in separate rooms. They're prisoners. 
And basically the prosecutor says to each one of the prisoners, they say this, if you rat on that guy, if you tell us that the other guy did it and he says nothing about you doing it, you go free. If he rats out on you and you don't say anything about him, he goes free. If you both rat out on each other, you get five years. And if one of you rats out on the other and the other one rats out back, then you get three years. Basically what it's saying is, if you screw the other guy, you get a very large reward. You go free, he gets 10 years. If the other guy screws you and you don't screw him back, he goes free, you get 10 years. However, if you screw each other, then you get a smaller punishment. You don't go free, but you get a smaller punishment than you would if you let the other guy you know, roll you. Now what happens when you play this game is actually very simple. And, and what we find in, in the prisoner's dilemma is you have to screw the other guy. You have to. Time and time and time again, they, sometimes they can run uh, millions of iterations of this very, very simple program uh, with computers, and they find out that according to the rules of the prisoner's dilemma, you have to screw the other guy. Because if you don't, and he screws you, he wins huge, and you lose huge. And so, basically, that's the rules, except for, except for something that absolutely really riveted my attention. And, and as it turns out, screw the other guy in the prisoner's dilemma is the way to go. However, there is a subset of this game with a different result. And the subset is called the iterated prisoner's dilemma. What does that mean? In the iterated prisoner's dilemma, you don't just go through this cycle once. You don't just ask the question, do you, do you confess? Did he do it? Did you rat him out? You don't just do it once. You keep doing it. And the reason the iterated prisoner's dilemma produces different results than the prisoner's dilemma is, in the prisoner's dilemma, you don't know anything about that guy. You don't know anything about the other prisoner. You have to assume that he's going to rat you out, and therefore you have to rat him out. You have to, because you don't know anything about him. However, in the iterated prisoner's dilemma, what you find is you have to face these exact same choices that you had, but this time you have to do it serially. You have to do it again and again and again. Why is this important? Well, it's important because that means that both you and your opponent develop a reputation. And the reputation is what changes the outcome from this dog-eat-dog -dog world to something much, much better. So. If you're playing the prisoner's dilemma one time, screw the other guy. You have to. You have no choice. It's basically just self-defense. But if you're playing against an, an opponent and you recycle this many, many times, they tried every single strategy. They tried everything. Constantly rat them out. Constantly not rat them out. Play fair all the time. Cheat all the time. They tried all of these things. And the best, def the best winning strategy by a margin was what they called tit for tat. Tit for tat means do to them what they do to you, with some preconditions. The preconditions are very important. The preconditions are you start honorably. You don't start by cheating, you start honorably. That's number one. You retaliate when he screws you over, and you continue to do that, but when they stop screwing you over, you stop screwing them over too. Because cooperation turns out to be the best possible solution for both parties. It's not as good as one guy screwing the other, but them cooperating is the best possible outcome for both parties over the long term. And in order to get to this cooperation, tit for tat is the best strategy. So why is all of this important and what does it mean? Well, basically it means this. If I'm playing against you and I start off honorably and I said, no, I don't, he didn't do it. And that guy says, no, Whittle did it. Okay, I'm screwed, 10, 10 years for me. Now we go through it again. What am I gonna do? Am I going to say, no, he didn't do it? No, I already know he's going to rat me out, so I rat him out, and he rats me out. And back we go, back and forth, ratting each other out. And our, and our scores go down, and our ability to succeed, and the amount of time we spend in jail basically goes up. And I'm going to continue to rat him out as long as he rats me out. But if he decides one time to not rat me out, then I have to change back to not ratting him out. It's tit for tat. Whatever they do to me, we do to them. Okay? So that's how it works. And this is why the West is successful and why the third world isn't. The West is successful because we play the iterated prisoner's dilemma. The third world is a failure because they play the straight prisoner's dilemma. I know we're walking all over the place, but I always kind of think that's the charm of the show. So, for example, I went to Mexico, I went to Cabo San Lucas, I was on the beach, and it was a very nice beach. 
I grew up in Bermuda, so I've been on I've been on the nicest beaches in the world, but this was a very nice beach. And I'm sitting there at this resort in, in Cabo San Lucas, and as it turns out that the beachfront in Mexico is owned by the people of Mexico. You cannot privately own beachfront. You can't privately own the, the actual beach where it goes into the water. And so, as soon as I set up my chair there, and I was sitting there getting some sun, the first thing that happens is five or six or seven Mexicans come up right in front of me, between me and the ocean, a respectful distance away, but between me and the ocean. And they set up little stands, and they're holding up trinkets for me to buy. And they're generally making my life miserable. And, um, and they won't go away until you buy something. And when you buy something, more of them come. What does this have to do with Harry Reid and Neil Gorsuch and so on? The Mexicans are playing the prisoner's dilemma. They're playing for short-term gain. They're assuming that they're never going to see me again. And also, to be perfectly fair, in many cases they're in such dire economic need that they don't have the uh, luxury of playing the, the long game. But because they're not playing the long game, they basically got, I don't know, fifteen, twenty dollars out of me. And you know what else they got out of me? They got out of me a pledge to myself, an unbreakable oath that I was never, ever going back to that country again as a, as a tourist. Never, ever. It made me so angry that I was being held hostage by these people that I said I'm never going back there again. So in exchange for the $20 they got, they lost $20,000, $40,000, the country, whatever, $100,000. They, the, they went for the quick strike. They got the quick strike, and in exchange for that, they lost the long-term benefit. It's like a used car salesman. You know, a, a good car, forget used, a good car salesman will come at you with, with something like this, and I've seen it happen many times. So, sir, um, let me just lay this out very clearly. I, I would like to be your car salesman for the rest of your life. I would like to be the person you buy a car from for the rest of your life. Now, we are in the business to make a profit, but I'm going to keep that profit as low as I can and treat you as fairly as possible because I'd like you to come back. That guy will be a more successful fi s uh, salesman than the guy who tries to sell you the undercoating, you know, and just basically wears you down until you throw that additional $300 in there because you just got to get out of this office and you will never see their business again. Things in America and the, and the West work because we play the long game. We start out by trusting each other. We start out by treating each other dis, uh, uh, respectfully. And, um, and then we start to have transactions. And as long as both sides are living up to their transactions, we have the success that's generated all this wealth around us. However, in America, if somebody screws us over, you hire a contractor, let's say, and you pay him a $20,000 down payment, and he's going to come in and um, start working on building a new addition to your house on Monday. And Monday comes and he's not there. And Tuesday comes and he's not there. And you call his office and there's no one answering the phone. In America, you've got um, recourse. In America, which still by and large plays by the rules despite what the Democrats are doing, in America, because of the rules, you get to say, okay, he has, he has defaulted on his um, obligation. He's played dishonorably. He's taken my $20,000. He could have had $200,000, but he took the $20,000 in exchange for not doing the work. And in a civilized society, the role of the government is to catch and punish that guy, and that's pretty much all the government does. That in a Navy and an Army. The role of the government is to enforce the rules, not be a player, not be on the team, not trip up the guys wearing uh, red and, and, and not see any penalties on the guys wearing blue. That's not the role of the government. The government's to be a, a referee and if somebody breaks their obligation to me, I have legal recourse. I can get that person. I can get my money back. At the very least, I can put them in jail so they don't steal from other people. That's how it works in civilized countries. However, in uncivilized countries, if somebody does something to screw somebody, what are you going to do? You can't do anything. My fiance is from Russia. And in a dispute over housing that her mom has, she decided not to fight this, even though she had the paperwork, even though she had the deed, she had all of it, because the other person had more money at the moment and could pay a larger bribe to the, to the judge. That's the short-term thinking that keeps countries poor. If you have a system of trust, then, then we can run a business. I trust that by paying an electric bill, these lights are going to stay on. Same thing for the internet. I have, I have trust that they're going to do what they do when I pay them. And they have trust that I'm going to pay them too. 
because if they if I don't they'll cut my internet off and eventually it'll destroy my credit and it's supposed to destroy my credit it's supposed to let honest people know and look I'm a guy coming out of a credit score of like 300 um, but that's not inappropriate it's a way of telling other people who have not met me yet well we've done the prisoner's dilemma with this Bill Whittle guy and when he was 24 he um, he ran up some credit card bills that he either couldn't or didn't play turned out it was couldn't and he's not a good risk I wouldn't lend him money works like a charm. Now over time, as I found out, you can in fact do what the prisoner's dilemma does, is you can you can go tit for tat but but stop retaliating. So I stopped taking out loans that I couldn't pay and I started taking out loans that I could pay. And they weren't very big loans at the beginning because my reputation was so poor, rightfully so. And as time went on, I was paying these bills on time and the people who were looking at my behavior said, it's a change. It's a relatively short-term change, but it's a change in the right direction. We like the trend line. We're going to give him a little bit more rope and see what he does. So the credit limits go up, excuse me, and you continue to pay them off. And now they're beginning to think maybe something happened to this boy. Maybe he was struck by lightning of some kind. Um, but he seems to be behaving much better than he did before. And over the course of 15, 20 years, my reputation has changed because of my behavior. So all of this comes back to Neil Gorsuch and all the rest of it. The Democrats have a history of voter fraud. They have a history of changing laws, substituting candidates at a late date in violation of campaign rules. They have a history of wanting to recount votes until Florida is a great example, 2000. In Florida in 2000, George Bush won the, the count and then he won the recount. And constitutionally, that's all you need to do. If, if it's a close one, you can get a recount. So he won the count, and he won the recount. And then he won the count after that, and he won the count after that. And they kept counting. And every time they would count again, new votes would somehow manage to appear. Oh, look, we found a, a, we found a, 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 tr a chest full of votes um, that was locked in somebody's station wagon. I guess they just forgot they were there. And look at that, 90 of them are for Al Gore and two are for George Bush. Let's count it again. And they'll recount, 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 and the Democrats were going to keep recounting. This is the point. They were going to keep recounting until the moment that Al Gore had more votes than George W. Bush, at which time they would say, now we have an accurate result. Now, now we have an accurate result. These people are not trustworthy. They have a very poor credit rating when it comes to political credibility and honesty. We need to treat them that way. We need to treat them as people who have a history of opening fire on people who are coming to bring them mercy in order to gain a very short period advantage, and that's how we need to treat these Democrats. We need to treat them like the Japanese. We need to treat them like people who are trying to rip us off because they are. If, over the course of years, we find out that the Democrats are playing by the rules and playing honorably, and what that looks like is, what it looks like is, they accept defeat because it's a fair defeat. After a few decades of that, then we can start to treat them honorably again. Who knows, maybe we could even reinstitute the filibuster rule. But if you think that we're going to do that in front of this crowd, especially in front of the, the, the legacy of Harry Reid, I say we pull the read option. I say we do the read option every single time. You wanna, you wanna do this, Harry? And we should call it the read option again, again. I don't know what it is about me, but there's something about the Republican leadership that is so dense that they don't understand the simple, 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 simple things. If you called it the read option, which it is. All of the opprobrium would, would go away. All of the, oh, you guys are breaking the filibuster rule. We're not breaking the filibuster rule. We're, we're employing the read rule. We're employing the read option. Harry Reid has set the new rules for the, um, for, the, for the game, so we're going to basically follow those rules. This is how you win in politics, and if it sounds like it's good um, advice to you, then you can certainly help us keep this message coming by becoming a member at BillWhittle.com. It's 33 cents a day to spread this kind of common sense out there. And the people who spend the 33 cents a day, to my absolute delight, tell me it's the best money they spent. So maybe you could give it a try if you're feeling a little blue. Okay, we're just going to go very, very briefly into the next one. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this next one, but just exactly, uh, here we go. There's our friend Harry Reid, miserable and life swine. Um, the, the, the secondary topic today, briefly, is I'm calling GOP Pelosiism. 
So when, when Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi were in charge of the Congress, Harry Reid was Senate Majority Re Leader and, and um, Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House, two progressive politicians. They gave us different legacies. One of the legacies was, thank you, Scott. One of the legacies was the, the Reid option. We're just gonna destroy this rule and because we want to and therefore it's destroyed. But the other legacy is one that is just filled with shame for me. I thought that when Nancy Pelosi, speaking about Obamacare, said, we have to pass the bill in order to understand what's in it. When I heard that, I thought that is the most embarrassing, damning, humiliating, un-American, politically motivated, trench bottom dwelling low life scum that I have ever ever heard we have to pass the bill in order to understand it this is the antithesis of how the republic is supposed to work it's the exact antithesis and over the course of the last um, six years since she said it since 2009 so six seven eight years something like that I have constantly constantly said this is the Democrats this is all you need to know about them we have to pass the bill in order to find out what's in it so imagine my shame and horror and embarrassment and humiliation imagine how much of the wind was taken out of my sails imagine how uh, depressed I was to find that the Republicans in the Congress are now doing the exact same thing with this health care bill they're doing the exact same thing. They're making last minute changes. People are saying we, we haven't had a chance to, to really read these, these changes. And basically the GOP is saying, that's okay, don't worry. Let's just get it passed because we have to get it passed right now because if we don't, we lose face. And so now the Republican Party is the party of we have to pass the bill in order to find out what's in it. It's a terrible, awful, awful, genuine shame. It's a shame. And... Um, Regardless of whether the bill was good, I'm, I'm finding out that Ryan just pulled the, the health bill off the table, so apparently it failed. Uh, it deserved to fail. But um, that aspect is not something I want to see from the party that I tend to identify with, and it's why so many of us, um, why so many of us still have a hard time calling ourselves Republicans when we're perfectly happy calling ourselves conservatives. The entire theory of it is wrong, and if and, and if you have to cheat to win, that's not the same. It's not, and it's not the same thing as the as the read option either. Um, it's just embarrassing, is what it is, and it's shameful. And we should be better than that. We should know better than that. One of the reasons that this bill is in such trouble is because it's it's um, it's new coke, right? Um, I've used this example before with political parties, but it's just as valid here. So. Um, we have a we have the world's best health care system prior to Obamacare. It's private insurance. There's some percentage of Americans, 7% un, uninsured, but 93% of Americans prior to Obamacare's implementation had the best health care in the world. And if you go back even further, we had the best health care in the world at a reasonable price. So when we find that 7% of the population was uninsured, we find out that probably 3 or 4% of those people were people who could have afforded health care care but didn't pay for it and I was one of them because I was a young person I thought I was gonna live forever and turns out I am but it's gonna cost me more money than it used to it's costing me a lot of money now so we get the health care bill we get Obamacare it's rammed down the throats of the American people and so on and so back to the new coke thing let's call Let's call the days of doctors making house calls and reasonable um, prices on operations where insurance basically functioned as a stop loss kind of a thing that your insurance didn't cover you going in to have a sore throat looked at. You had to pay cash for that. And, and the idea of insurance should be to protect you against catastrophic failure. That's what insurance is. That's why there's a deductible. Nowadays, with Obamacare, the deductible is so high that you need to have an insurance policy to pay the deductible on your health policy. But put that aside for a minute. What healthcare in this country has become is become such a gigantic, horrible mix of government and private business and um, and bureaucracies, both in the private and the public sector, that we find out that for every dollar we spend on healthcare, about 33 cents goes to actual healthcare, it goes to the actual doctors, hospitals, nurses, and so on. 
We send a dollar to Washington by force. They take it from our taxes. Dollar goes to Washington. Washington Standing Army takes about 33 cents out of that dollar, and then they pass the dollar on to the insurance companies, and that Standing Army takes about 33 cents out of the dollar, and they pay out to the actual doctors about a third, maybe 30, 40 cents on the dollar. It seems to me that a better system would be to take my dollar and find a doctor that I like and give him the dollar, because then I'd be getting three times the health care, wouldn't I? or the same health care at one-third the price, right? See, we can do some math on our side of the aisle. Simple math is not beyond us. So it's like new Coke. So we had, we had a health care system that was terrific. And frankly, if there was 7% of the population uninsured, we, it would have been far better, far cheaper, and far, 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 um, you know, more favorable outcome for the country if we had simply bought those people a private insurance system. <laughs> just bought it. It would have done far less damage than what was done. So we have Coca-Cola, which is a terrific brand. And then along comes the Democrats with Pepsi, and they're starting to gain a lot of, um, they're starting to gain a lot of momentum. You know, Coke's share is going down. Pepsi's share is going up. People are saying, we want free health care. Pepsi's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what does Coca-Cola do? This is the biggest mistake in the history of business in the mid, uh, I want to say the 80s, maybe the 90s. Pepsi's gaining market share. Coca-Cola has the most recognizable brand in the world, in the world. And as Pepsi gets closer and closer and keeps growing relative to Coke's market share, instead of Coke just putting the hammer down and saying, we are Coca goddamn Cola, and, and, and uh, who the hell do you think you are? Who drinks Pepsi? Losers. People, on, on people with, 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 you know, low, with very low taste. Coca-Cola is the world's drink. Pepsi-Cola is a cheap imitation. That's why you find it in low-class places. Instead of doing something like that, Coke panicked. They panicked. Again, biggest business mistake in the history of U.S. business. They panicked. And so what they decided to do was, wow, Pepsi share is gaining. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the best brand of the most well-known drink in the world and we're going to change it. And we're going to call it New Coke. New Coke. What does New Coke taste like? New Coke tastes an awful lot like Pepsi. Now, you can understand the logic behind this. Pepsi's market share is growing. Coke's, Coke owned the share. So naturally, since they're the king of the hill, their market share is, is going down. Coke sees Pepsi going. And if you're an idiot, you would say, let's try and make our product more like that product to slow their growth and to keep our market share. So they make new Coke. And who drinks new Coke? Do Coca-Cola drinkers drink new Coke? No. New Coke tastes like horse piss. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's certainly not Coca-Cola, and I like Coca-Cola. So my Coca-Cola that I've loved my entire life is gone. I can't buy it anymore. It's gone. I have to drink this new Coke now, which I don't like. So do the Pepsi drinkers drink new Coke? No. It tastes too much like Coke for them. They like Pepsi, and they stay with Pepsi. So what Coca-Cola did was they came about this middle position that basically said, we're going to make something that nobody wants, and that's what the health care bill is, right? It's not what we want. It's not Coca-Cola. We want a repeal of Obamacare. We want the government out of the insurance business. We want the insurance companies to stop covering things like a, you know, like a scratch on your wrist. My car insurance company doesn't cover uh, the oil change or, or a flat tire. Uh, the car insurance that I have is, um, is designed to prevent catastrophic damage to my car. You do that and all the prices go down and all the rest and all the rest and all the rest happens and that's what we want and we didn't get it. Uh, the Democrats want single payer. They're the Pepsi guys. And what the Republicans put out was uh, new Coke. They put out a bill that's not Pepsi and it's certainly not Coke. It's in between and they're wondering why it died and, um, and I don't wonder why it died. It's crystal clear to me. Crystal clear to me why it died. So there you go. By the way, um, the consequences to New Coke were interesting. Um, within a couple of months, people, first of all, when, when, when Coca-Cola, as we understood it, disappeared, people were hoarding Coca-Cola. People were buying cases and cases and cases of it. And, and it was actually, for a brief period there, it was something like, you know, valuable. Like, you have some real Coke? Yeah, I got Coca-Cola. Holy cow. Is that New Coke? No, no, it's Coca-Cola. Okay. So um, then what we found out is... Um, we found out that 
Coca-Cola sales just fell off a cliff down to nothing. And so immediately, Coca-Cola realized, my God, we made a horrible mistake. A horrible mistake. Um, and so what they did was they brought a new product. We have new Coke, and now we've got another new product, and we're going to call it Coca-Cola Classic. Oh, what's Coca-Cola Classic? Coca-Cola Classic is the stuff that you used to drink and like so much. It's Coca-Cola. And then for a brief period of a couple of years, we had Coca-Cola Classic and we had New Coke. And then New Coke just basically went away because nobody wants it. And it is now a distant and painful memory in the boardrooms of Coca-Cola and in the boardrooms of every other business in America who look at what we basically have as a problem. Hey, Brian, uh, if you think I'm rambling, you, you know what you can do? You can do that, and also you can simply leave and go someplace else. So um, there you go. Uh, and, and that's not all you can do. Um, so there we go. And I'm finished with my uh, rambling for the day, regardless of what these lunatics think. It's a hell of an incredibly good um, analogy. It's brilliant insight into the current political situation, and you're just too stupid to realize it. So go be bored someplace else. This is too intelligent for you. You can't follow it the way our regular uh, followers can. It's beyond you. It's beyond your intellectual capacity. That's what people like you do. You make fun of things um, that you don't understand, which is why you're making fun of everything. Snark is uh, the weapon of, of, the, um, of, the, of the morally retarded against people who have actual intelligence. In any event, um, that's about it. Um, yeah. All of the rest of you, especially our members, thank you very much for your continued membership, your continued support. I don't take people like that very seriously. I think the one or two trolls that managed to find themselves in here ought to go back to watching, um, I don't know, maybe go back to reading their slash porn or, or back to Minecraft. I suspect most of these people are 14 years old anyway, they certainly act that way. Um, so. Honor is the cure to cowardice, Vincent Ferris says. Vincent, that needs to be on a t-shirt. And I'm not going to do it because I'm a reputable person, but my God, that is the, the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my life. Honor is the cure to cowardice. Absolutely is. In any event, that'll do it for us today. Now, look, when we come back uh, next week, we're going to come back with a, a different show. Uh, not, we're going to come back with a show that hopefully is, is more unique than, than the one we've got here now. A lot of people say this is basically just a stratosphere launch. To some degree, that's true. But at least we're dealing with news stories, not with member Collins. So I've been talking with our friend uh, Heroic Neil over there. And um, we've been talking about the technical setups. Not a terribly tough thing to do, but we're working with two people here. So, you know, it's a little bit tough. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into an interview show. We're going to book some, some talent. We might do it uh, twice a week, maybe three times a week. You cannot book guests every day and certainly not two guests every day and run a show, not with this staff and not with this kind of thing. If you were to do that, if we were to book a guest every day, we'd be reduced. We'd have to get like Andrew Clavin or somebody like that, you know? We'd have to go. That's how down in the bottom of the barrel we'd have to go. So we're going to bring it back next week. I don't think it'll be every day, um, but we'll try to bring it back with, um, with call and guests. And I had a lot of fun uh, doing the Grant um, Stinchfield show uh, in Dallas and... Um, and we did a lot of interviews on that show. It was a lot of fun. So we'll see what happens. Uh, in any event, uh, I'm not knocking uh, Stratus for Lunch, Cheryl. I'm just telling you. Uh, I'm just uh, seeing Dave Rubin. I'm, I, I want to be on Dave Rubin's show, and he can be on mine. So there we go. So we're going to start out by doing it um, with Skype. And then over time, we're going to destroy this. Uh, you can't see it right now, but I'm sitting on a riser. It's a little wooden platform that weighs about 900 pounds. It's just it's nuts. It's just nothing but two by fours. Um, in any event, uh, that's what we're going to do. So um, w once we get uh, the, the Skype thing worked out, we'll probably rebuild the little risers here so we can do on-camera interviews with people in the same room. That's a lot of fun. we got two bitchin' microphones, so we might as well pull it off. Anyway, that'll do it for us today. Um, as usual, thank you for the members at BillWhittle.com who not only uh, made the front half of the show possible, but for this entire week have had um, both half of the shows possible. We've heard repeatedly from members who have a right to their own unique programming saying no it's a good message you should get it out there those are the kind of people that we have here and the kind of people who who make my life um possible 
not just professionally, emotionally. I run into people like that when I see people or hear people doing things like that. I just think, my God, I'm on the right team, that's for sure. So until um, either Monday or Tuesday, we'll put up a notice, something like that. Uh, we're going to be going back to the business of making firewalls and, um, and these new economic videos. So we'll, uh, we'll be doing that. By the way, if you're interested um, in becoming a sponsor of either Firewall or Right Angle or anything like that, I mean a, a, an actual sponsor with an on-camera commercial, we'd be happy to do it and talk to you about it. If you're interested in that, it's uh, info at billwhittle.com. And perhaps we can work something out. In any event, that'll do it. So uh, thanks very much for joining us. It's been an interesting week as usual. And um, we will see you with some kind of a guest, I suspect, um, early next week. You know, be careful out there. Have a good time. We'll see you soon.